Hi, this is Professor Cummings. I want to give a uh, presentation on another strength of materials. On this one in particular, I want to talk about axial loads. Uh, axial loads are a, a condition that takes place in a lot of different design circumstances, a lot of different manufacturing, and other circumstances where you have a load on something that's actually going in along the parallel to the axis of a piece of material. Now what I wanted to show you just to demonstrate this is a picture of a, a spindle on a lathe. So what we have, you know, on one end we have the chuck. You know, you can see you've got a couple of thrust bearings. And you have, well, obviously the drive shaft here that's holding it in place. You've got a nut and then, you know, back here it actually attaches to a motor. It rotates your chuck and the work takes place down here on the outside of the spindle. You know, so you've got a lathe tool that will actually cut your material. So this is a, a spindle on a lathe. And uh, even though there's a lot of complicated loading that takes place, one of the loads that actually takes place a lot is a axial load. So anytime you've got a work piece that's held inside of the chuck and your tool is actually cutting along the axis or in the direction of the axis, you're creating an axial load into this drive shaft. And that's one of the reasons why you have thrust bearings and other ways that the lathe is designed is to be able to address any of those axial loads. So what goes on when you have an axial load in anything, in particular in this, in this lathe drive shaft? Well, you have this axial load, which is actually showing that you have a, a stress that's actually being developed. In this case, it'll be a compressive stress, you know, because the load is actually being applied inward you know, along that part of the axis versus, say, a tensile stress where this thing was actually being pulled and extending the axis. So you're developing a stress. So we got a stress is equal to the load over the, the area, so the area of the drive shaft. And here we have the equation written out in, uh, mathematically. You're also creating a strain. Strain meaning that the drive shaft, even on a very small level, the length of this shaft is being distorted. So what you have is this strain, which is showing the, the change in length over the original length. And here this is written out as the equation for strain. So strain is the change in length over the original length. So these are the things that actually take place if you have any kind of a load going on in, in a any type of material member. You're actually you know, applying a load and you develop a stress and a strain. A stress meaning an internal resistance to that load and then a strain meaning that you're actually changing the length versus the original length. Now keep in mind these two concepts of the stress and the strain. So as we look at this, you know, so we've, now we've got our, our dry shaft back, you know, our, our spindle you know, assembly back. You know, what you're also going to deal with is a displacement. Now this displacement it's very closely related to that strain, that change in length over the original length. As a matter of fact, if you see this diagram where we have the formula for strain, you can see that the displacement is simply the di change in length over the length if we looked at that original equation. And down here, if we look at this member, which has got an original length, it's rod, and then you actually put a load to it, you end up with this change in length. So this strain is the equivalency of saying a change in length. So that is just another way of saying a displacement. Excuse me, I call that a strain. So, so that displacement is just uh, the actual change in length. And that is the displacement on that member. Now what else goes on when you consider that change in length? So looking over here on the left of the screen, we have the original equation for the strain, which is just a change in length versus the original length. Now, if we can remember some of our relationships, we've got the modulus of elasticity. You know, that's just the relationship between the strain and the stress. And we also have the equation that the strain is also equal to the st uh, stress over that modulus of elasticity. So this is still a relationship, mathematically, that works. The st uh, stress over the modulus of elasticity. So now, let's look at this a little bit more. The relationship can change, uh, stretch out a little bit more. You, again, we have the strain is just the ch uh, change in strain over the, excuse me, the displacement over the length. And we can take that other relationship of what exactly was 
the stress, which is just the load over the area, oops, load over the area, and extend this relationship a little bit more. And what do we end up with? We end up with a load over the area, over the area, divided by the modulus of elasticity. So just taking this equation and writing it out a little bit more. So now let's go back and start looking more at this displacement. If we go ahead and uh, substitute, do a little bit more substitution, particularly around this one section of the displacement over the length is equal to the strain, we also have the load over the area divided by the modulus of elasticity is equal to strain. Set those two equal and we end up with this equation here or this relationship. And if we just multiply both sides by our length, multiply both sides by the length, you can cancel the length and you end up with an equation that you can have for the uh, displacement. So down here we can see an equation for the displacement more related to different aspects of what's going on as we load up this spindle. Okay, so we have a load, we have an original length, we also have an area of the drive shaft, and we have a modulus of elasticity. This is a standard, you know, constant, so long as we're dealing with it in the elastic state. This is something that's going to be a known this is going to be a known force and this is a known area. So we can take all these, put these into this equation and we end up with how much we can expect uh, this drive shaft to actually displace so long as we're under that specific amount of load. So this is something we can actually predict and calculate ahead of time whenever we have something under load. So that is just one more concept to keep in mind when we consider uh, materials under axial load. Now there's one more concept that I want to go over today that tends to be a little bit more complicated. It's, it's, let me take the back. It's actually very intuitive for most people, but it tends to be a little bit hard to understand when you see it written out. Now this is a lot of wording, but let's go ahead and go through it. It's called St. Venant's Principle. Now this is quoted from St. Venant's. If the forces acting on a small portion of the surface of an elastic body are replaced by another statistically equivalent system of forces acting on the same portion of the surface. This redistribution of loading produces substantial changes in the stresses locally, but has a negligible effect on the stresses at distances which are large in comparison with the linear dimensions of the surface on which the forces are changed. Now what does all that mean? That was all a mouthful. Let's break this statement down until it's nice little components. So that's our original statement. So let's take this again. The forces acting on a small portion of the surface of an elastic body. Okay, so we've got something that's actually, uh, say we have an elastic body, which, you know, isn't unusual if we're talking about the design. We always design inside the elastic limit of a material. So we've got an elastic body and we're considering this a small portion of the surface with a force being applied to it. So let's say we just have a force, or we have an elastic body, and we have a force being applied to a small portion of that elastic body. So force is acting on a small portion of the elastic body, replaced by another statistically equivalent system, or excuse me, yes, statically <laughs> equivalent system of forces acting on the same portion of the surface. So if we were to place this load, with an, a statically equivalent, meaning half of P here and half of P here. So P over 2 and P over 2. So P over 2 in both places. In both places, if we replace by another system, uh, statically equivalent of forces acting on the same portion of the system, so it's in the same portion of that surface, the redistribution of loading produces substantial changes in the stresses locally. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that the stresses produced here, you know, locally, or whatever we're defining as locally, are substantial changes in stress. And that is pretty intuitive. You know, basically what we're saying here is that the stresses that are produced in this situation, where you have a load in one spot 
it's going to create a concentration here versus if we divide that load in half and put it in two different spots you're going to end up with a completely different profile of stresses on that on that body on that elastic body and you can kind of think of that if you're pulling on something that's stretching and you hold it in one spot versus in another you expect the stresses to to look a little different now the next statement it has an Neg has a negligible effect on the stresses at distances which are large in comparison with the linear dimensions of the surface. Now that's a fancy way of saying the further away you go from that or where the forces are applied the more negligible how the forces are actually being applied to the surface. So the more negligible that you're applying it at P2 or P of 2 divided by 2 versus P in one spot uh, the further along further away you get from that point. So in looking at this you know, elastic body, assume this is an elastic body. So we have the forces acting on a small portion of the surface of the elastic body. Replace you know, is basically saying that this is actually going to produce something that's very focused based on where that force is applied. So what that means, the St. Venant's principle is essentially saying that if you load something up, you know, depending on how you put the load or apply the load to that body, you'll see a profile of that load, a distribution of that load that reflects how that load is being applied. So in this case, we've got a load being applied down the center, and we're noticing that the stress is actually being focused at the center. If we applied it at both ends here, at the top and at the bottom, so again, P over 2 and P over 2, then you would see a completely different profile, something that will look more where the concentration is up here, it would go down and then come back up again. So you'd end up with a completely different profile. However, the further away you go from this surface, the more you end up with something that looks more uniform. So this would end up being a more of a norm or an average stress within the body of this or within the, this elastic body. So that's St. Venant's principle. And one way to, to look at this is with a finite elements analysis. So there we have the same figure, you know, the free body diagram that we were talking about. And again, back to that magical portion of the statement, has a negligible effect of the stresses at distances which are large in comparison with the linear displacement of the surface. So here's something that is uh, more of a free or finite elements analysis. So where we actually take the same type of stress, and we notice that the further apart that we go, the further, further apart we apply these two forces here and here are these two loads of P in this area here. The further apart they go, the more or the less and less of an impact that it has here according to this finite elements analysis. And that is the St. Venant's principle. Now, one of the things that are important to understand about this principle is this not only um, impacts how something is uh, being held in, under axial load, meaning that the further you are away from the load itself, the less of an impact that you have based on how this load is being applied. It also speaks to other concepts like stress concentrations. So meaning that if we were to have a some disruption in the geometry of this part, which could just simply mean a hole someplace or a notch somewhere in the material, that we would still see the whole concept of St. Bernard's principle being applied. You know, so since this is going to create more of a concentration of the load, it would actually impact how this load is being applied. We would actually notice that the way the stresses are going to react at these disruptions is going to be great at the point of disruption, but greatly reduced, greatly diminished, almost to the point of negligible the further away you are from that disruption. Okay, so this is Professor Cummings. Just did a, a presentation on axial loads. I want you to go ahead and, uh, if you can, if this was helpful to you, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. You can also catch me on Google+, Plus, as well as you know, Twitter and Facebook. We have a Facebook page. I upload, upload those or modify those on a typically a daily basis. So, you know, if this, again, if this is helpful to you, I'd appreciate you to, to subscribe and check me out on those, those platforms. All right. Thanks a lot.